Hello and welcome to this video on what is item response theory. My name is Christian Geiser, I'm an instructor and statistical consultant with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. I usually talk about multivariate methods including factor analysis, structural equation modeling, multi-level analysis and latent class modeling and also often about topics in psychometrics and measurement. If this is something that interests you, please subscribe to this channel. Also check out the description for additional resources including workshops that I offer through Quantfish. In this video I want to give you the basics behind item response theory or IRT. So what is IRT and what is it good for? On a conceptual level we could say that item response theory as the name suggests is a psychometric theory for the analysis of item level data. Also, item response theory provides measurement models for outcome variables or response variables that are categorical typically, meaning items that are binary or dichotomous that can take on only two values such as right or wrong or yes or no or agree disagree or that are ordinal in nature. For example, items that are partially correct where you have maybe a score of zero for incorrect, one for partially correct, two for completely correct, or you have Likert style type questionnaire items that are rated on a four point scale or five point scale from completely agree to completely disagree. And so those types of variables, response variables or item scores are categorical, they're not continuous variables, they're not metrical and therefore they require special treatment and item response theory is designed to handle items that are binary or ordinal in particular. Most item response theory models are for categorical data. So what is special then about categorical data? Why do we have to have special psychometric models special psychometric theories and or measurement models for categorical data. Why can we not use models that we already have, like, uh, like for example, models of classical test theory? So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. Here's an example of an item that we might analyze with item response theory. So this is an item of the so-called cube comparison test which is a measure of spatial abilities where you're supposed to compare the cube on the left hand side to the five alternatives A through E on the right hand side and you're supposed to find the one that can be manipulated or rotated into congruence with the target cube on the left hand side in this case it would be E. And so here these would typically be scored as 0, 1, 0 for incorrect if somebody didn't find the correct alternative and one for a correct response. And so then the question is how do we analyze an item like that using psychometric models? So here you can see a standard linear measurement model illustrated. That's a type of model that we use in classical test theory where we have various models for continuous data for continuous test score variables and it's a very very simple approach in classical test theory where we simply assume that there's a linear relationship between the latent variable or latent trait eta here on the x-axis that we want to measure for example the latent spatial abilities or the latent spatial ability trait in our case with this cube comparison item. So that's what we want to measure and that's something that is continuous, a continuous ability dimension on which individuals differ. But now in our case the item true score or the item score is not continuous. It is bound between 0 and 1. You can only have a correct response 1 or you can have an incorrect response 0. And so when we apply a linear measurement model like the ones that we apply in classical test theory then we run into a problem. So here this would be a model for example of essential tau equivalence where the item true score is related to the latent trait and there can be an intercept alpha i so there can be an 
item easiness parameter because different items may be different in terms of their easiness. And so when we have a model like this, then we run into one problem where you can see that individuals who have a latent ability that's greater than about 3.3 or 3.4 here on the X axis. So individuals who are uh, better than that, so to say, who have stronger ability, they would then have a predicted item score above one if we use this linear model. And that doesn't make any sense because you can't more than solve the item or you can't have a higher than one chance or higher than one probability of solving this cube comparison item. So either you solve it or you don't and you could have a certain probability based on your latent trait ability, but the probability can't be smaller than zero and it can't be larger than one. And so that's the reason why standard linear measurement models like the ones that we know from classical test theory are not really great when applied to binary items and also they're not great typically when they apply to ordinal items. So that doesn't mean that classical test theory is bad. It just simply means classical test theory is designed to handle continuous outcome variables such as for example some score variables of a test or questionnaire sum score variables that reflect the average or me uh, average or sum or across a set of questionnaire items for those types of variables that are quasi continuous or that are continuous classical test theory is very useful but not so much for binary items or other types of categorical test items so then what do we do about this so how do we get away from this linear measurement model that obviously is not very useful when we have an outcome variable that is bound between zero and one. So how can we address this issue? And so in item response theory, this is addressed by using a nonlinear test model or nonlinear measurement model instead of a linear measurement model. And so for example, one very commonly used IRT measurement model is a model that uses an S-shaped function to relate the continuous latent trait variable that is metrical to the item score. Here you can see again on the x-axis I again have my latent trait eta, so that's the continuous latent ability to perform well on the spatial abilities test and then on the y-axis here I have my probability of solving the item. So that's the probability that the item score will take on the value of one, meaning item solved, given the latent ability. And so you can see this can only vary between zero and one because that's a probability. And now with this nonlinear S-shaped function here, we are able to keep the predicted probability within the admissible limits for probability. So now we will never predict a probability above one, even for somebody who has a very high ability on the latent trait. So even somebody who is all the way up here, we would predict a very high probability for that person of solving the item, but we would not predict that this person would have an above one chance of solving this item. And likewise for individuals with low latent trait score with low ability, we would never predict that they have a probability below zero for solving the item. And so that makes more sense conceptually. It's more elegant. It's a model that makes more sense. And it's still approximately linear in the middle. So when you look at the middle portion of this S-shaped function here, you can see this is practically linear. So it doesn't really make a huge difference. Uh, from a linear relationship in the middle portion, but then towards the extremes it is spread out so that it will not predict an impossible probability value. Now the question is how do we get this function, right? So a linear function is easy, but how do we get a mathematical function that describes an S describes an S-shaped curve like this one? And there are different possibilities, and the one that is most common in item response theory is a so-called logistic regression. Uh, relationship or a logistic test model, which is also known as the Rush model after the Danish mathematician Georg Rush, who developed this model. Since it's a logistic test model, it's also ca uh, called a one-parameter logistic model. That's a synonym for 
the rush model and you'll see shortly why this is called a one parameter logistic model. So what does the equation look like for the rush model? Here you can see the model equation for a probability of solving item i given the latent ability. So that was exactly what was plotted on the previous slide in the graph. And so you can see with that mathematical function on the right hand side you get an s-shaped curve. So you can see on the right hand side we have eta, which is our latent trait variable, and we have an item difficulty parameter, alpha i, so that is subtracted here. And the whole, um, or the difference between eta and alpha i is exponentiated in the numerator, and then you have one plus um, exponentiation of that in the denominator. And this function here gives you an S-shaped curve. Now, why is it called a logistic model because you can also express the same model equivalently in terms of the logit. What is a logit? So a logit is the natural logarithm of an odds and an odds is the ratio of two probabilities. So in this case the probability of solving the item divided by one minus the probability of solving the item, meaning the probability of solving the item divided by the probability of not solving it and then taking the natural log of that. That's called a logit. So here so say we have um, expressed the Rush model in terms of a logit now instead of uh, through a probability. And so when you use the logit parameterization of the Rush model, then you can see on the right hand side you have a linear model again. So this model is still linear in the logits, but it is non-linear in the probabilities, which makes more sense because probabilities are more intuitive than logits. A logit scale, even though it's a continuous scale, it's not super intuitive. It's not something that humans work with a lot, but with probabilities we work a lot. So typically we would depict the item characteristic curves in terms of probabilities but you can also express this model in terms of a logit and therefore it's called a one parameter logistic model because each item only has a difficulty parameter alpha i so there's only one parameter in the model there are also IRT models that have more than one parameter there's for example the two parameter logistic or Birnbaum model which has also an item discrimination or slope parameter and so therefore it's a two parameter logistic model. The Rush model is special in that it has only an item difficulty parameter and what that does is it leads to so-called item characteristic curves that are all parallel, that all have the same slope and so that's a very characteristic feature of the Rush model and it's also a very useful feature for certain purposes when using the Rush model and therefore the Rush model is a very popular item response theory model that is very frequently used in practical applications when you have a set of binary items and you want to scale the items, you want to find out about the item difficulties, you want to find out about whether the items measure a Rush homogeneous scale, meaning a unidimensional scale with equal item discrimination. How can you do that? You can apply item response theory models, including the Rush model, in a whole bunch of different programs. There are specialized IRT programs that you can use. There are also general purpose statistical software programs that you can use, such as M+. And so here I want to show you a quick example from an IRT Rush model output in the M+ software. You can see that M+ gives us the IRT parameterization here and it has item discriminations which in the case of the rush model are all constrained to be equal across items in this case i was analyzing four different items of this um, cube comparison test and uh, then what the relevant output here is or one part of the relevant output are the item difficulties which you can see here at the bottom that characterize these items in terms of their difficulty and they can differ between those items. Those item difficulties can then be used to plot the item characteristic curves that I showed you on the previous slide. And then plus can also be used to test the Rush model. So there are tests of model fit that you can use to see if a Rush model is at all appropriate for the data that you are looking at. 
I hope you found this video useful to learn more about item response theory. Please feel free to check out the description for additional resources, including workshops on IRT that we offer through Quantfish. And I hope I will see you next time.